terms. Now, if I put here a parameter t, uh, which runs between zero and one, so for t, I can also put t in front of here, uh, this, will, uh, this will be a homotopy through for the whole maps between uh, you know, uh, for t equals one, I have exactly the complex that I have, but for t equals zero, I will have just uh, the, the terms that I have written down on the blackboard. So what we have actually for t equals zero is a sum of two complexes, which we have already seen before. Uh, so what was that? So the first complex was zero goes to zero goes to uh, gamma s plus to gamma s minus zero. And here is dA plus. And the other complex was zero goes to omega zero, omega one, omega two plus zero, and we have just d and d plus. Now, <coughs> what you can easily see is that the determinant of d a plus, so what is that? This is the determinant of the kernel of d a plus, uh, well, you know, lambda top tensor, lambda top, the core kernel of dA plus. But we can identify this with the, uh, you know, uh, the kernel of dA minus. Now the point is that both dA plus and dA minus are complex linear operators. So in particular, the kernels are, uh, uh, complex linear vector spaces, and they always have a preferred orientation, at least if you fix your uh, convention. Right, so conventions are uh, not really uh, uniform. You have to be aware of that. But once we uh, fix the convention, this is always R. Okay. Now it's also easy to handle this complex. Right, so the corresponding operator here is uh, d plus plus d star, and if you take the, uh, if you want to consider the determinant, so we have the kernel of this uh, is just uh, h one m r. Well, uh, we have was uh, always purely imaginary. Uh, and the core kernel is also easy to compute. This is just H0. Uh, let me write, uh, just write H0 plus H2 plus. And these are topolo uh, so uh, these are spaces which are defined, uh, which are determined by the topology of your form, form manifold. So you may ask to. Uh, or you may orient uh, these spaces, and this doesn't depend on the smooth structure. So the upshot of this discussion is that an orientation of those homology spaces actually determines you an orientation uh, or a trivialization of the determinant line bundle. So let me write this down. So Maybe. Okay. 
Very good. Uh, so we now have all the ingredients that we need. And let me state this formally. So we have arrived at our main theorem. And the theorem is this. So assume p2 plus of m is at least 2. Then m g eta is a smooth compact oriented. So I write oriented, but you know, uh, I should have written probably orientable and with uh, choice uh, of orientations of homology groups we have oriented. Uh, manifold of dimension D, and D is a number uh, which already disappeared from the blackboard, but you remember. And this holds for generic G and eta. Over for any two choices, G0, eta0, and G1, eta1 is a bow. Uh, M, G0, eta0, uh, and M, G1, eta1 are oriented. So uh, by now you actually uh, know already the proof of the theorem. Maybe the only thing uh, what I need to say is uh, why do we require B2 plus at least two? This is something that we have already discussed. Uh, this is because if you choose G0, at a, so two pairs of parameters, we want to connect them by a pass, and we want to uh, consider the module as a parameterized modular space, and we will uh, avoid reducibles whenever B2 plus is at least two. Th this is where uh, it appears. Okay. Now let me come to the point. So, the Zyberg written invariant. Here is what we have. So, <coughs> I will pick any. M0 in my base manifold M, uh, then what I have, I can uh, take any uh, map with values in U1, and I can evaluate this at the point M0, so I have a map into U1. This is clearly surjective. And the kernel of this uh, is denoted by G0, so this is just the, the, the subset uh, of all those gauge transformations which are identity at the point M0, and we have the following exact sequence. Okay, now what we have is I can take m hat eta to be the space of all solutions psi eta such that SW eta psi eta is zero, but I will divide this by the base gauge group G zero. And now what you see uh, here is the rest of the action, so we have an action here by 
u1. And if, if I quotient by u1, I will uh, get my original moduli space back. Right, in other words, what I have is m eta hat fibers over m eta, and the fiber of that is u1. In other words, we have a principal u1 bundle over the moduli space. Right, so this is principal u1 bundle. And let me denote by mu its first n class. Okay, uh, now. Uh, so uh, uh, it was not explicit in the uh, notations here, but uh, sort of implicitly to just to define those moduli spaces, we have chosen a spin C structure, right? So I have here, I made a choice of sigma in SM, and this is the set of all spin C structures. Okay, now I can define the zyberg witten invariant relative to uh, this choice of the spin C structure. So SW of sigma is defined to be an integral over m eta of mu to the power d by two whenever d is even or it's zero otherwise. And so uh, with the works that we have done so far, you know that uh, this number that I have defined uh, does not really depend on the choices. Uh, so that we have uh, an orient, uh, we have uh, a number. Well. Uh, uh, if you want to be strict here, uh, this, uh, the zyberg witten invariant uh, is uh, only the absolute value of the zyberg witten invariant is well defined, right? Because we have made here the choice of orientation, uh, but I if you can fix your underlying uh, topological four manifold, then you can make sense of this as, a, as an integer. So uh, if you combine all this, this is just a map from S of M into that. And the basic property that, so this is the zyberg witten invariant. Now, the basic property that this invariant have uh, is uh, the following, SW vanishes on all but finitely many uh, spin C structures. And uh, the proof is not really hard. Uh, this follows from the a priori estimates that we uh, have had uh, already before. Uh, but this is an exercise for you. So you will solve this today in the afternoon. Okay, so uh, let me finish uh, this lecture with a uh, sort of uh, collection of results that you can uh, obtain with the uh, help of the zyberg witten invariant. So uh, there is no time left for proofs anymore, but uh, I thought it may be interesting uh, to see where this could be applied to. In any case, the, one of the first theorems in this uh, area was by Witten. Um, so if M 
admits a metric of positive scalar curvature and B2 plus of M is at least two, then uh, the cyber invari invariant vanishes identically for any spin C structure. And again, the proof is uh, sort of uh, just follows from the Weizenberg formula. So that's uh, something that uh, you can prove on your own. Now, the next result, uh, this would be all uh, sort of the whole theory could be uh, absolutely boring. It could have happened that we would end it up with a very complicated description of the zeros map, right? Uh, and that's. Uh, would be very disappointing, but uh, Taub's proved very general statement which tells you the following. So assume M is symplectic and uh, uh, as always we assume that B2 plus is at least two then the claim is that the zyberg witten invariant of M does not vanish. The statement is uh, a little more precise, but I don't want to go into details here. Uh, sh should I uh, explain what a symplectic manifold is? Okay. Now, <coughs> uh, so this gives you uh, lots and lots of examples where the zyberg witten invariant doesn't vanish, so you know that uh, your invariant uh, is an interesting one. Now, so uh, by the way, you can play here and you can uh, combine those two results. So if you know that uh, B2 plus of your manifold is at least two, then either, uh, so if it admits a symplectic structure, it doesn't admit a metric of positive scalar curvature and vice versa. And uh, this is the only way I know, which shows you that, you know, uh, a priori there is no reason to expect that symplectic structure is related in any way to metric, uh, metrics of positive curvature, but this actually tells you uh, there is certain relation. Okay, so. Uh, Yes, and CP2 is also not a counterexample. Um, so uh, another uh, result uh, is the following theorem, usually at attributed to Witten, so who gave us uh, a sketch of the proof, uh, is uh, the statement is as follows, so assume M1 and M2 have both B2 plus uh, at least one, then the cyborg Whitney invariant of the connected sum M1 with M2 vanishes. Do I need to explain what the connected sum is? Okay, so what this <coughs> uh, result tells you is that uh, you can interpret this in the following way. So assume you know that the zyberg witten invariant is non-zero, and you try to decompose your manifold into a simpler building blocks, but here simpler building blocks would mean uh, <coughs> manifolds with B2 plus at least one, and uh, you will establish uh, this is impossible. And one more result, so I wanted to uh, show you is the theorem of Donaldson, originally proved by Donaldson much earlier by other methods, but you can reprove this uh, with the help of uh, the zyberg witten theory, is that there are 
mennyi ö, topological closed four manifolds which do not admit a smooth structure. Uh, so I don't want to specify what many means, but this is really a, a huge uh, sort of family of uh, four manifolds, which are, uh, you know, where you have an atlas where uh, transition functions are uh, continuous, but can't be made uh, smooth or, you know, uh, CK for K, say, two or something. Okay, and uh, one more result, which is sort of complementary, uh, to the last theorem uh, is the following. So again, uh, the results that I will state in a minute uh, was proven earlier by uh, other means, but still uh, it's interesting to state, I think. Uh, so what I mean the theorem by Fintuchel and Stern is that uh, there are infinitely many uh, manifolds. Oh, uh, here I should say, well, let me just say, uh, manifolds of dimension four, uh, say parameterized by some number, uh, which are homeomorphic. But pairwise non diffeomorphic. So, in other words, uh, uh, what uh, so what you can say is uh, that if you take uh, four manifolds and there may be so a topological four manifold, then there may or may not be a smooth structure. And if there is one, it may happen that there are infinitely many of those smooth structures. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure for me. And uh, if you wish, uh, please give me the evaluation forms back. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>